This podcast contains content that may be disturbing to some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Greg, I am so excited to interview you. I have been to both of your presentations at Phenomicon the last two years. I've got your books. I've listened to all your podcasts. Like, Wow. Yeah. The way you investigate and the way you talk about metaphysics and the paranormal is like right up my alley. So thank you so much for joining us today. This is an honor and I'm so excited to interview you. It's my honor. I'm really, I'm really glad to be here. So you do more with cryptids than I thought, because I saw that you have written a, a Mothman book. I have. Mothman is my favorite cryptid, but also I, I live in Texas, so I'm familiar with the chupacabra and the Texas terror dog and all those things. So that is actually very exciting. I didn't realize there was so much here. Well, so people always ask me, what do I do? And I said, well, I'm, I am, uh, and, and I can say this because I'm a certified expert at um, police procedural and investigation. So I just use that model, um, whether I'm doing UFO, alien, abduction, uh, cryptid, spirit, metaphysics, all that. I, I use that method. Which, when you say that method, that method is, you know, like 1,500 pages out of a book. But <laughs> so I, I know a lot about a few things, you know, because when right. I, I'm not, I, I've talked to a lot of uh, uh, paranormal investigators and they're like, ah, I've investigated 1,500 homes, you know, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I do maybe crap. two a year. That's no, a sure. lot. But I, yeah. I do it very deep, you know, I'm not, I'm not just there for, for a couple of hours and, and leave. So, yeah. Thanks a lot for the plug. Hi, messages from yeah. Mothman book. It's um, a good. It's a good book. I am well, going to read you. it. I'm very excited about it. Mm. I have multiple Mothman shirts, and uh, my children. I like. I don't know why this happened, but I will walk around my house and I just go Mothman, and now all three of my children <laughs> do the exact same thing. So I had a day recently uh, when I had my Mothman shirt on, and my daughter came in and went check out my Mothman shirt. And I flipped around. I said, look at my Mothman shirt. <laughs> so I'm a huge fan and I was super excited to see that. And tell us about the Mothman book. Yes, please. Your interpretation of how people experience the paranormal. Right. I've, I've had a lot of people, you know, I, I wrote a book called The Disorient Express and it's really funny because I'll get um, uh, reviews on it. And it's like, uh, don't buy this book. It doesn't have a single train in it, you know, and it's like, oh, the, the Disorient no Express. Train. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the Disorient Express, uh, you know, the Orient Express, the train, the Disorient Express is what the mental health police officers call their car when they get called somewhere. Oh, it's a oh. Disorient Express. Got to take them to the state hospital, right? I like so you that. get the Disorient Express. The Disorient Express. I didn't know that that was a thing. And so that's almost what happened with this one. Um, as you know, there's not a lot of information on Moth. Mm -hmm, there's no. a, those core things, and that's what happened. And then you have a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, superfluous. Interpretations. Yeah. yeah. Extra stuff that people kind of added to or whatever. But the phenomena, the, the, um, the uniqueness of Mothman isn't that unique because it, those situations happen in many different places and people get these, what would be premonitions or synchronicities or like a, a little red flag that the, the universe is kind of waving at you. Uh, and typically, and I will generalize this, as growing up in America, you're probably raised in some sort of Christian environment which minimizes ghosts, no such thing as monsters, believe in the word, and that's what you do. <clears throat> and yep. <laughs> so what happens is if this stuff is happening, and if there's all these signs all around you, and we're, you know, taught not to pay attention to those signs. I mean, honestly, that's that's what we're told. You can just kind of go through your life and everything's fine. I have friends of mine that I have great amount of respect for. I, I went to catechism with them, uh, you know, uh, um, coming up in, a, as a Catholic, Roman Catholic, uh, and going through 
all of the processes that you do, altar boy and all that stuff. And I have friends of mine that are still in the Catholic church, still do. I'm, I'm recovering Catholic, by the way. But anyway. <laughs> Um, hey, we're both recovering Mormons, if that makes yeah. any difference. We're in, we're in good right. company. I've heard, I've talked right. to a lot of Catholics now, and I feel like we all have, we have the same sort of shame triangle going on. So like, yeah. we speak the same language. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Yep. So, so I, I sit there and go, all right. Um, I, I look at them and they did what their priests told them to do. They did what their coaches, what their teachers told them to do, what their parents told them to do. They grew up. Graduated high school, went to college, got out, married their girlfriend, uh, got a house, got a job, had kids, have grandkids, and it's fine. And 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 they're wonderful people, but they never ask, "What is this all about?" They just are right. linear, and this is what I do, and this is how I do it, and they don't ever ask those questions. You know, those existential questions of why am I here? What is this all about? How, how you know? It's like so, they're already supposed to know, yeah, right? Yeah, like, or or not, and just trust in the word. You know, right? mm-hmm. you put, put all your faith in God and and yeah. and being trying to be a good person. Yeah, uh, and it'll work out. And that's a nice, nice place to be. Isn't it is it? a nice place you know, to, to be. Have that faith is a and, great place. To be. Yeah, until you have questions that aren't answered by yeah, faith, like until right. it doesn't work. Yeah, until exactly. it doesn't work. And you yeah. know that Satan doing that to you. That's yeah. Satan. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. You are being tempted by <laughs> Satan. Right. You are so in the grasp. With, with this book, you know, I, I kind of took a linear look at Mothman from beginning to end of the of the book, but all these other things that happen throughout history, throughout the United States, some overseas things. And we can go through life and not ask questions and not recognize maybe these synchronicities that that pop up. We look at it and we go, you know what? I'm running late. I got to get going. That was weird. Oh, I, you know, I got to, I got to get this email out. Wow. That was strange. I was just thinking about you. Where, what, you know, my phone rings. Oh, there's all these things, right? Mm-hmm. And, and psychologists and psychiatrists will of course, normalize all that. And they'll explain why, you know, our brain works this way. And no doubt our brains are designed to find shapes and find these puzzles and and, and try to make sense out of it. And we put all that away. Mm-hmm. Well, in the book, I just pose really the book, I pose the question of what if when these things happen, you actually paid attention and assigned meaning to them? Right. How would, what, what would your life be like if you did that? Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of where that all went. And I, I didn't expect the book to go there. You know, that at the end of the book, it's like, yeah, go out and have an adventure. Woo. You know, <laughs> how did I get there? I don't, I don't know how I got there. Yeah. But I just follow the little lines, you know, I'll follow the little flags. That's kind of my favorite way to do things, though, is to follow the trail of where you're led. And at the end of it, you you either have a conclusion or you don't, but you walk away with an experience. I've always been one of those people that enjoys, I like listening to true crime and dark history. And my first introduction to Mothman was from a true crime podcast. I'd never heard of Mothman. I couldn't even believe, like, at this was several years ago before I was into the world of mysticism, but you know, I was listening to it and I was like, what the fuck is this? Like Mothman? <laughs> are we, are we serious right now? But the more that yeah. I dug into it, the more fascinated I became because it is, it is synchronicity. So whether or not you want to tie Mothman to it. And I know there's, there's so much to unpack there, but uh, men in black and all of those different things associated with Mothman. But at the end of the day, it is like a harbinger of doom situation where yeah. you you see yeah. the, you have these warning signs and then there was this huge tragedy. And that's what initially got my interest was that like the monster aspect was fun, but like the story of how awful this was, that sounds terrible. I should phrase that better, but you know, it is the, the tale of human suffering that made it worse. Well, but yeah. yeah, all the synchronicities and all of the, the, the folklore surrounding it, like how do we put that into our own lives and, 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 I'm, and your book kind of like puts that all together. The way I kind of look at it or, or the way I kind of portrayed it is in this journey that we're having, uh, and, and I and, and I am w- one of the worst as far as not following what I'm about to say. 
But in this journey of what's happening, whatever is happening here, I think assigning meaning and living your life in a way that your experiences are meaningful, as opposed to just making the donuts, just making the donuts, just making the donuts. So I, I go through and I just give a whole bunch of different examples of these red flags that, that are solid stories, that are documented stories that, you know, something amazing happened out of it. But you can also say, well, it was just random. You could say that. You, yeah. you know, uh, uh, right. for instance, um, in, in Aberfan, a town in England, there was a coal tip. The town was down yes. here and it had a, a mount or a, a very large hill uh, and they were digging coal out. They've been digging coal out for years and they just kind of pile it on the side. Well, it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And all the people in town were concerned about it, concerned about it, concerned about it. Uh, and then one morning, uh, people were getting up, going to school and all that stuff. And this thing came down on the town uh, and killed a bunch of children, killed some other people at school. The night before that happened, uh, a, a woman came forward to show a, a uh, crayon drawing that her son had done uh, the night before. And he predicted that the coal tip was going to fall down on the town and kill everybody. And it was just, you know, that's that's really good timing for the kid, right? And, he, and the kid died. And oh. yeah. That's sad. Well, you, you look at that and you go, okay, w- was that a premonition? Was, was that something like that? Or, or was it, everybody just talked about it so much. Did we, did they manifest this into happening? Or that, or this kid mm-hmm. just randomly drew this picture of, of it falling in because it's like right there. And that's scary. Because right. you've heard um, it so many times that it's just on your mind and that's what comes out. If you ignore the drawing and just go, Alice, that was nothing. You know, the kid lived here. Everybody talked about it all the time. Everybody knew it was going to fall down. He just drew a picture and it was just random. Uh, and that's what happened. And you just move on. W- what if you assigned meaning to that and actually took action when you feel or, or see these things? But I mean, that's where it happens. Let's say um, a person was, let's go to Mothman. Person was at the Silver Bridge uh, on that fateful day. Mm-hmm. And all those cars are driving across the bridge and the light turns red and the cars start backing up. And now it's not a car with 20, I mean, not a bridge with 20 cars crossing. It's a, it's a bridge with 60 cars on it. So right. all that weight and the cars have gotten bigger since the bridge was built. Uh, the, the, the construction of the bridge was not sound to begin with the way they designed right. it. Uh, it's one of those one fault bridges. One thing goes wrong and the whole thing goes. Yep. And so somebody sees this thing flying around above the bridge. And they're looking at it and like, wow, what was that? And then the bridge <laughs> collapses. They go, oh, he was here to tell us that the bridge was going to collapse. Or he was here to cause or the he, imminent he destruction. To cause the bridge to collapse. Right. In, in either case, do we, and I say we don't, but do we have the courage to start yelling at everybody? Get off the bridge. The bridge Get off is going to collapse. Now. No, yep. because then the Disorient Express, the cop and the white jackets come to get you. Right. Uh, you go to the state <laughs> hospital. And the guy's freaking out. That's like the the Final Destination movies where they did. They were like, get off, get off. And everyone's exactly. like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So heroes often fail. Oh, they I often love that. fail because they take action. Uh-huh. And many times the action that they take is a misunderstanding of what's going on. And that's the thing is, is we're often uh, scared to fail. We don't want to look s- silly in front of people. Right. And, but you, you have to be courageous enough to, when something happens, to step up and say something. I mean, we could go into history and go, well, look at all the good Germans yes. in, in 1937. There's a bunch of good Germans there. It was good Germans in 1945. I love history. But yeah. The worst part is, is when, when bad men are doing things, good men don't stand up and stop it. Mm-hmm. And we all recognize it, but we sit back and we go, eh, I really don't want to. Hmm. We don't want to step in and. So it's the same thing in life. It's the same thing with our life. You know, I mean, uh, quit your job and go on a, an adventure to write a book uh, about, you know, what you're going to do. About the boss man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, I can't do that. I got to pay my bills. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, but if you do this and you write a great book, maybe, you know, a million people will buy it because you had the courage to go on this trek and this this thing. 
Yeah. What, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, fortune favors the bold where Mm -hmm. you are taking a risk. Yes. But that risk could pay off and then Mm -hmm. you could have the experience and the reward versus just staying at home and doing nothing. And I've been listening to your podcast and one of the things, or your broadcast, and one of the things that I've heard you and several guests say is the desire to travel that so many people are saying, Oh, I wish Mm -hmm. I could go here. I wish I could go there. And your point was get a less expensive car. And that's not in like the, the budgeting way that we hear a lot of like, well, just don't buy coffee, but genuinely a $400 car payment versus a $200 car payment means you can save the difference. And at the end of the year, not every Mm -hmm. month, but at the end of the year, you could take an amazing trip and you can do the things you want to do. And if you can find a $400 car payment now, you tell me because. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. We're making house payments for cars now. Oh gosh, yes. I, I grew up in the car business. My dad was a dealer and um, we never drew, drew, well, he drove demonstrators, but you know, he knew better. And I grew up knowing like, I'm going to lose 20 grand on this car when it rolls off the lot. I'm not buying that thing. It's deciding where your priorities lie. Do you want to have a life of luxury or do you want to have the experiences that you're dreaming of? of? Yes. Are you, are you brave enough to take the leap to chase your dreams and to have these experiences or are you going to stay at home with your fancy car (laughs) or your regular car in today's times? And watch TV. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's the kind of the design how everything's set up is we got all this TV to watch and run home, get something to eat, sit in front of the TV and watch TV. And zone out, um, yeah. In the spring and fall, I always enjoy. I'm in Georgetown, Texas, so I'm just north of Austin. When I get home and I find out that my behavior modification unit, whose name is Lynn, uh, is like two hours behind me getting off work, man, I jump on that motorcycle and I'm... And I got you know, <laughs> two hours to go out and mess around and there's all kinds of weird stuff around here. And I just go out and look at, look at things. And Speaking of Greg, you're growing up. Yours sound very similar to mine where your older brother like took you <laughs> urban exploring, exploring and scared the crap out of you. Yeah. I want to hear about that. Cause my brother did the same thing to me. Oh yeah. So my brother, his name is Bill. I have his picture right up there. He passed away uh, two years ago, oh, I guess. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. He was a fantastic, sweet guy, musician his whole life, uh, which meant, meant he painted houses and <laughs> you look at this far, as far as work goes. So he was uh, 12 years older than me. So when I was five, he was 17 and he had a um, Triumph Bonneville 650 motorcycle or 750. I think maybe it was a 750. A very cool, like 1969 motorcycle, very cool motorcycle. And he would take me, no helmets, and he would sit me on the gas, ta- gas tank, you know, because I was a little bitty guy. And, uh, and we would go ride around out in central Texas, ride around. And we would stop at all the, uh, uh, the cemeteries, and we would stop at all the old buildings that looked abandoned or, or anything weird, right? We did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Middle Fifthville <laughs> Cemetery in North Austin uh, is a pioneer cemetery. So there's some really, really old graves there. We would go there, and he would turn off the motorcycle, put the kickstand down. We'd get off, and we would walk around, and he would try to find the youngest buried child uh, in, the, uh, in the graveyard. And then he would tell, you know, he's like, look. You know, Billy Watson was younger than you. And and then he would go into this long story about, he didn't know anything about Billy Watson, but anyway, he'd go into a <laughs> long story about this horrific thing that happened to him, you know? Uh, and so that, that's why he would do stuff like that. Yeah. He was, uh, he was horrible. <laughs> My brother used to take me up to, we had the Teton Dam, but it was a spillway and he would take me up there and try to scare the crap out of me. We had this little car that was like a hatchback car. And one time the hatchback, like, I guess that it, he didn't shut it all the way when we were driving up there. And so it like flipped open, 
when we were on our way up there and me and my friends freaked out. And anyway, my, my brother really enjoyed scaring the crap out of us. Yeah. Some big <laughs> brothers tend to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went from that to doing that with my friends, you know, I'm, exactly. we would be doing that. there's nothing to do. I'm like, Hey, isn't there a graveyard over there? Hey, there's that old building. And hey. we, we would go do that. You know, me, me too, because I, I grew up in a small town where there was nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. So you have always been more open minded for the paranormal then, because I know that your background is in law enforcement, which I find fascinating, especially given the work that you're doing now, because one of the things that you said in your podcast, too, was the difference between investigator brain and medium brain that was on your episode with one of the mediums. And I was wondering how you learned to be so open-minded. Yeah, there's two, I think there's two avenues of what I I would refer as open-mindedness. One of them is um, I was supposed to be an artist. And uh, at the end of high school with my, you know, straight D's and a couple of F's, um, Uh, My plan was my dad was going to hire me, pay me a bunch of money, and I was going to create sculptures and and artwork, right? Uh Uh, Uh-huh. Then the economy collapsed in 1982, 81, and everything went just like it did in in, 2008. And so everybody lost all this money. All these businesses closed down. All of a sudden, I'm out of school, Mm -hmm. uh, and I have found a job, and I have no skills whatsoever. My girlfriend at the time was smart enough to get rid of me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I went to a, uh, I, I went to this uh, uh, temporary agency and I, you know, filled out my application. And, and my experience up to that point was I build, I built fences. I worked at Sonic and I worked at Pizza Hut. Uh, so I Love had a Sonic. real wide range of skill set. Right. You know, so, um, yeah, which I'm glad I worked at Pizza Hut, man. I, I I had a great time. Anyway, so I go to this guy and there's this old man and he's like, he looks like an old professor. You know, he looks like he's been retired and he doesn't have anything better to do. So he goes and and, and decides to work for this company. And he looks at my application and he goes, uh, you need to practice on your writing, my friend. I can't read much of this. You know, I'm like, oh, well, you know, hell with you, old man. <laughs> and uh and so he goes, oh, you don't have any skills. You don't have any son. Can you go into, you need to go to school. I'm like, ah, my dad made too much money. I can't get any grants or loans or anything. I don't have right. a job. And he goes, well, son, you need to go in the military. And I was like, you have got to be out of your mind. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Three weeks later, I'm on a bus going to San Antonio in the army. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I got nothing. And, and there was, there was no jobs anywhere. Nobody was hiring. Uh, and so I had that indoctrination, a four year indoctrination in the army. And I, I was a, uh, uh, I was a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division. In, in that four years, I was deployed to, um, uh, we went to Grenada. I was deployed to uh, Central America through Honduras, El Salvador, San Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Panama. Uh, then deployed to uh, North Africa, Egypt, the Middle East, and then stationed over in the Sinai Desert. So I had a wow. really good amount of travel. And because of, uh, of the way I am, as soon as I get time off, I'm not at the bar drinking, which I will do that, but <laughs> I love a drink. I take advantage of where I am. And I try to, f- I tried to find the weird thing. And so back then this was in the eighties. So you would actually have to read these things. There's these things called, um, they're called books. One of them's called the Disorient <laughs> Express. Right there. <laughs> and you'd have to look up stuff in a thing called an encyclopedia. I know the that encyclopedia. Be- yep. And so you'd have to look up these things wherever it went. So that's where I, what I would do when I would go out. And I think uh, doing a lot of travel abroad, I realized that not everybody thinks like a white kid from Texas. Right. From what? Rockdale. That's weird. <laughs> uh, a white Catholic kid from Rockdale, Texas. Not everybody thinks the way I do. Weird. So I, it broadened my mind a little bit as far as this is all okay. There's a million ways we can do this. This is all okay. What's not okay is when you create a victim or you try to control other people. Oh, I love that. Everything else, we just do it, man. We are all doing the best we can with the information that we have and yeah. our life experience. So if you are trying to live your best life and you're not hurting anybody else, you do yeah, you. Just be a decent person or just be polite. You know what I mean? Just, yeah. Uh, it seems so easy, right? It does seem so easy. 
I think the the less exposure you have to a wide variety of people and places, you become very rigid in how things have to be. Right. And sometimes they do have to be that way. True. Like being True. polite. As a as an artist, I'm I'm thinking outside the box there. And as a law enforcement person, they put me back in the box and I go, okay, I have this template that I have to operate from in order to be use industry standard and uh, uh, best practices techniques for conducting an investigation. And part right. of that is exculpating. It's, it's, it's part of that is proving who didn't do this, right? Uh-huh. Which a lot of cops don't concentrate that much on. They're like, I'm going to put somebody in jail for this. We got to um, solve this case immediately. It's a high yeah, pressure. And, and those guys... When a when a medium or a psychic or an intuitive or a sensitive or whatever you want to call it wants to be a part of it or give information or whatever, they will roll their eyes, right? And just like whatever, I'm not mm. doing that. And that's the that's a confusion that a lot of people have is uh, people are like, oh, he's a skeptic. Well, you damn right, I am. Think about right. all the people that have been trying to trick us our whole lives on everything. Yep, skepticism is great. Yeah, one of the things I say, and I think Melissa and I have the same view on this. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I know you, I feel like I know you well enough to say that we're believing skeptics, that Mm -hmm. it's not always paranormal and it's not always haunted. It's not always demons, but it's worth investigating. Skepticism runs on a line. Mm -hmm. You have true believer over here and you have cynic over here. And Mm -hmm. skepticism floats along that line based on the evidence that you're providing. Mm-hmm. Right. And so when somebody rolls their eyes at you, that's that's contempt. That's that is lack of respect, contempt, and they're not going to listen to anything you have to say. That's cynic. Right. Uh, and then you have, you know, the, the true believer that just, you know, the the orb is grandma, you know, and look at this. This is grandma's here to protect me. You know, it's like, yeah, that was uh, taken in uh, the Sinai Desert, and it's probably the most dusty place in the world, and probably. <laughs> you know, you know, so, the psychics or the sensitives or whatever um, that have information, um, you can dismiss it, or even if you don't believe it, listen to them because they will think in a way that you don't as a in the box cop mm-hmm. and they will provide other things. I've, I've worked with uh, uh, multiple mediums on a couple of missing cases and uh, some, uh, some homicide cases and they've never solved the case for me, but they provided so many more avenues for me to travel down, to ask more questions to, to where, when you look at my case, they're like, yeah, there's no other place to go here. We have no idea what happened. I feel like that's where your own intuition comes into play, though. And it's those narrow-minded cops that are way over um, confident in their skill set, uh, very arrogant. That ty- that real strong type A arrogant narcissist. Those guys are dangerous mm-hmm. because they they will paint people into a corner on on certain things and can make people's lives hell. It'll all typically come out in the wash, but still, you know. Sure. Yeah. It's very difficult. Can you talk about your standard procedures that you use to investigate? I always give the example of a haunted hill house up in Mineral Wells, Texas. Yeah. The, the reason I give this is that it has everything. Anything you want to know as far as paranormal, as far as a, a ghost, shadow people, that sort of thing. That's it. So I get contacted uh, by the owner. They had just bought it. And uh, she looked me up online. She contacted me. She goes, hey, uh, you know, how much would it cost for you to come up here and investigate? I said, I don't charge anything. That's uh, I do this as a passion, but I have some rules. And one of the rules is you have to give me your location for 24 hours and you can't be there. <laughs> and most people say no. Right. And she's really? like, okay, fine. Yeah, cool. They say no? Oh, oh so yeah. She's- yeah, they don't want you. I mean, you know, if it's like a, your normal house where you sleep and you got your food and your dog and everything like that, they're like, ah, no, I'm not doing that. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll help you. I'll help another person that wants to go investigate. If they want to run things by me, I will, I will help you evaluate evidence and think about things, other things that you can do, but I'm not going to travel there and just be there for a couple hours. Sure. Right. It's just, yeah. it's, it's just not enough. So I went up there and um, she she showed me the house. The house is uh, really interesting. It's got uh, a very detailed lore to it. She tells me all the stuff and I'm like, all right. So they take off. Uh, I make sure that the uh, uh, there's nothing in the refrigerator and I 
secure power to the house. Everything's done. The, the main breakers outside, turn it all off and let the house sit there and cook for a while. The theory is, you know, I mean, electricity could be doing something or whatever. So I, I kill all that. And I picked some areas out in this yard and I did metal detecting out there. While I was out there, I found a uh, a knife uh, and it had an iron blade on it. So it's probably uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, I found a uh, a woman's bracelet oh, and wow. a woman's earring. The woman's earring was actually later identified uh, as a earring of a lady who was murdered there or at another location. Uh, and they had been looking for her and her family identified that earring. So there's these other things that could be popping up, right? And so I take care of that. Um, I get under the house. The house is pure and beam. I get under the house. And that was kind of interesting because there's all this crazy, like hieroglyphic painting underneath the house. Really? Right? So it was all weird. Oh just It was very artsy, weird painting under the house. And so I, I didn't find anything like it wasn't, it didn't look demonic to me and everything. And it just looked, like, you know, maybe a kid was just freaking out down there or some people that were doing drugs got down there and was, I don't know what they were doing. Anyway, <laughs> so I get up, I, I go in and then I check all the doors and I, I use the, I actually use an EMF or an, a K2 meter uh, to make sure that there's no um, um, switches in the doors, any kind of levers or anything that's actuated by a battery or whatever. I look at at that. I use a couple of other instruments just to make sure somebody's not trying to trick me. <laughs> people try to do that. What? And uh, and so I, I lock everything up and it's getting dark and I set up my cameras. I just do analog audio and video uh, and digital audio and video side by side. And I, I spread them all out and I do an hour and then I go to those locations, pull those up, put new ones down and then download everything and spend my hour downloading everything on the computer. Several things happened that night. The ba downstairs bathroom door uh, opened multiple times. Now these are really old locks and I'm a grown man. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but I know how to close the door and something was opening this door and it wasn't, it wasn't an electronic lock. It wasn't pneumatic. It wasn't, I don't know what was happening, but it would happen when I, when I'd leave the room and do that and I'd switch out and that door would just pop open, and I could not figure it out. So that happened. Um, I was upstairs and there's a, uh, the story of a, a little boy that this was supposed to be, of course, a brothel at one time. It's right next to the uh, uh, a, a very large hotel that's that's been condemned for a long time. So the theory was that uh, the guys would stay at the hotel and they would go out to smoke cigars, but then they would leave and go over to the brothel. Uh, and it was also a speakeasy. Well, everything. I mean, isn't everything? You know, I mean, that's the, the ghost yep. of this house. This used to be a speakeasy. This used to be a brothel. You know, that's what happened. It's a very common tale. <laughs> yeah. I had looked uh, uh, online and I had uh, done some open records over there as far as the property goes. And there wasn't any fire calls there. Well, there wasn't any EMS calls. No, uh, you know, law. And there was a couple of law enforcement calls, but they were just random, loud music disturbance kind of stuff. And so there wasn't anything major. There was uh, two deaths that happened on the property, a little boy uh, and an old man. The uh, old man was from the 1800s. And supposedly this little boy was the uh, son of one of the prostitutes that was there. And he was he's playful and he throws rocks at you. Well, I got hit with a rock inside the house. Walking oh my down gosh. The Are I'm you upstairs serious? walking down the stairs. And it hit me right in the back of the neck and it landed on the, on the ground. And I, of course, turned around. I'm like, what? I had a great adrenaline dump. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I, I did a competition skydiving for about 18 years and I used to love, yeah, I got a good adrenaline dump on that oh one. Oh my gosh. And so I go back up and I'm trying, I'm thinking, you know, do they have, you know, like somebody in the wall that's shooting, you know, um, darts at me and what, what, what is going on? And so I look and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, was there, a, is there some sort of trigger or something? And then I looked on the stairs. Now these are wooden stairs. There's no place for anything to go. I couldn't find what hit me at all. And I spent like, I wasted like an hour trying to figure this out. I go down, I switch out all my cameras and everything. And I'm going back upstairs. And as I'm going up, I'm looking up and this bright, super bright light pops out into the right corner of my eye and I go to look at it and it starts traveling out of the kitchen and I'm trying to catch up to it, but I, my eyesight can't catch up to it. And it zooms out the front door. 
Oh, my goodness. Great adrenaline dump. Also, it's nothing like, uh, you know, four o'clock in the morning yeah. in a haunted house and having no a big, kidding. you know, bright orb float through there. That was my experience at that moment. This is true. This is the deal. This is this is what's going on, right? Yeah, no this shit. Is the deal. I had that, you know, I'm just like, what the? I don't know what's, what's going on. So anyway, do the rest of the investigation, pack up everything, uh, and I leave. And I get home, and about two weeks later, I'm in my kitchen, and this bright pop pops out. And I go really? to look at it, and I can't catch up to it, and it zooms out the front door. Oh, my gosh. I was like, I have an attachment. It came home with me. How great is uh-uh. it? You know? <laughs> which, which most of us don't believe in. We're like, nah. And then I started thinking, damn it, skeptic Greg. <laughs> all my behavior modification unit. Who works for an eye doctor? Hey, I just saw this really bright light. It's a, I saw one, in, you know, when I was up at Mineral Wells, and she's like, "Get into the office." I go in, they check my eyes, and I had an ophthalmic migraine in my right eye. Are you right serious? Eye. Yeah, oh. it's, it's, like a, it's like a cramp, like a little seizure in in, in the muscles. Mm-hmm. I have and when those. It, when that happens, it could touch your optic nerve, and when you touch yeah. your optic nerve, bing, bright mm-hmm. light. So. Sucks to be me. My ghost went away and I don't have a ghost anymore. (laughs) That's insane though. You figured it out. That was a profound experience for you. And I actually will say that your takeaways from that experience are also still valid and real. But I wanted to ask you, when you investigate, do you prefer to investigate solo or do you like a group setting? By myself. Yeah, by yourself. By mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah, and and I find that you know people are like, oh, did you see that? Hey, did you see that? You know, well, look, what's this over here? You know, it's like, I I'll, I'll go to the bar with you, and and we we can talk about that. But as far as investigating, I'm, it's too distracting. It's too chaotic for me. Mm-hmm. And, I, and maybe I just haven't worked with the right people or not. But it's just easier for me to be there by myself, and I can take everything in. At, at Haunted Hill House, afterwards, I I did some more uh, research on it. And one of the other things while I was there, you know, they, they said it's a brothel, right? And, a, and a, a speakeasy. I'm looking at the house and there's like this space that isn't accounted for. Kitchen and then the front bedroom and the hallway. It's like, what's between that? What is that? So I call the lady that owns the place. I'm like... This is weird. And so I call her and she goes, Yeah, go to the chim or go to the fireplace. So I go in there and and I said, Don't tell me anything, but is there something weird? And she goes, Yeah, you probably need to check it out. Go look at the fireplace. And so I go in the front room and I'm looking at it. I'm like, Wow, I didn't pick up on that at all. But this fireplace is way too big. Right. It it was like it was like four feet high. It's a big fireplace. Like a room all in itself. So I squat down. I go into the fireplace because it's just flat on the floor. And I look up and there's a metal grate right there. And it had hinges. You push it up and there's an entire room you could park a car in. That's where they were hiding all the liquor. Oh, no. <laughs> <It's big easy. laughs> yeah. They would just close that thing and light the fire. The cops would come in and they're like, what's going on? You know, and, and they wouldn't find anything. There's oh a fire God. here. There's yeah. nothing but a fire. <laughs> so uh, after I saw that, I was like, there, there, you know, there's some validity to what they're saying here. I can't find a lot of documentation, but there's some validity of the, the design, the position of the house, all that stuff. So I have a friend of mine, um, Gypsy Jules. She's uh, she does work with uh, Beyond Oak Island and Oak, the TV show Oak Island. I love uh, that show. She's a yeah, professional uh, uh, metal detectorist. And so every once in a while, her and I get together and go out and like fish around in the in the woods or in the uh, streams and stuff around there. And so I said, Hey, uh, can you know? Do you have some time? Can you come up here? Because this is it's a long way. It's like a four hour drive from here. Can you go and? Uh, detect the backside of this property because I'm sure there used to be other buildings back there and, uh, you know, a trash pile and all that stuff. So she goes and does it. She finds some stuff. But the coolest part she found were these little silver things. You know what a skull, you know, container looks like? The cardboard tobacco skull container that has a silver top that fits on top of it. I know some people know and some people don't. Yeah. Yeah. It looked like that. It was shaped like that. It's a flat top, but it's got a rim around it. It was about that big. Weird. And it said uh, three widows on it. 
Ooh. It was it was embossed. It said three widows. She found several of these. Ooh. Um, three widows are condom tops for reusable lambskin condoms. Reusable <laughs> ink. <laughs> reusable. Just wash it off. Just wash it That's off. That's my takeaway Ew. from this whole thing. Ick. Ick. <laughs> <laughs> that's what? oh gosh <laughs> yeah so this absolutely was a brothel and there was a pile of them back there and yeah in the garbage so i mean that that puts it all together so it kind of gives you an example of of my methodology of what's going on and i i, I would prefer not to uh, know too much about what is supposed to happen there um you talk about being on a podcast with david schrader mm -hmm. And you drink. Yeah. And Carly and I want to know how we can get involved. Um, <laughs> I'm, that. I'm pretty sure that he will have you on as guests. No problem. Yeah. yeah. I love a drink. If I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. We just did our, we just did our 200th episode like two weeks ago. I think the premise behind the whole thing is, is Dave is the newscaster and we're his reporters and we come up with uh, these stories. We we look for the stories. We just do the stories, right? None of us read well, so uh, we mess it up. And every time we mess it up, we have to take a drink. And so by it's it's the paranormal sixty minutes. Paranormal sixty. It's a drinking by game. Yeah. Paranormal ninety eight. We're pretty drunk. Yeah. It's, I have found it so enjoyable to listen to. <laughs> some some uh, episodes are better than others. But. Yeah. It was like drunk history meets the paranormal, right? Where you're <laughs> right. like, it, it, sometimes it starts out strong, but then the longer it no. goes on, the more unhinged it becomes. Oh, yeah. And that is what I'm here for. It has been such a pleasure. So nice talking to you. I loved hearing your stories and, and your perspective on things too. It's very unique, I feel like. So thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. My pleasure. If you loved what you heard today, please consider leaving us a review. Death Becomes Us is an Emotional Pictures production produced by Sarah Nichols and Alex Eisenstein. 